Um, and I would like to introduce this session on inclusive energy transitions. This is a, a new initiative that's coming out. It's uh, like all of the new initiatives that are being proposed across SEI right now as part of our next round of strategic uh, work. These are ideas that come up from the bottom, from uh, activities that several people are carrying out. Different researchers identify converging strands of work and see possibilities for uh, creating a more coherent program that would focus on a particular issue of interest. Um, I would say the person who's uh, promoting this most strongly in SEI right now is Oliver Johnson. He's going to give the first presentation. Um, and he points out that the, the discourses on low carbon development and inclusive growth are strangely disconnected. He's going to discuss dimensions of inclusiveness and illustrate with an example of solar PV from Kenya. After that, that and, and I'm sorry, Oliver is in their Africa Center. Uh, that presentation will be followed by one from Taya Noman of our Talon Center, who is going to push the our boundaries, perhaps, of thinking about what is included in inclusive uh, energy transitions. Because Estonia is um, a, a relatively equitable country with a history of um, socially inclusive processes. But the question is, uh, the question she addresses is uh, conflicts between environmental policy on the one hand and and energy policy on the other, renewable energy policy, in the particular case of marine ecosystems and wind parks, offshore wind parks. Matthew Fielding is then going to take us um, back. In fact, the three of these, three of the presentations are based in Africa. And then we've just got one um, from Europe. So the Matthew Fielding will be presenting um, on Sorry, I can't read my own handwriting. Uh, <laughs> about a project in Sierra Leone, uh, looking at sugarcane production, a uh, sugarcane production strategy. There's a plan to develop sugarcane. This could pr produce, contribute to uh, electricity production in the country to a really s surprisingly large degree. I was very surprised at the numbers he was showing. Um, but the question is whether it's going to be socially beneficial or not, and uh, he and his colleagues are doing a survey to investigate just that. Uh, Matthew Fielding is here in Stockholm, but he's with SEI and SIANI, uh, the Swedish International Agricultural Network Initiative. And I believe, are you going to present on SIANI separately? Okay, so you'll hear about SIANI tomorrow. Francis Johnson in Stockholm will then tell us about energy transitions. I'm sorry, this is not in Africa. In Indonesia, um, he and his, uh, and his colleague, Samita Silveda from uh, KTH, a study in Indonesia where there has been rapid growth that has switched Indonesia from an energy exporter, an oil exporter to an oil importer. Um, they're looking at alternative energy sources, and he argues for the possibility of some very positive outcomes looking at second generation biofuel production. And finally, Caroline uh, Ochiang, who is here in Stockholm, will share her work on three uh, SADC countries, uh, South African development community countries, and she will describe a study looking at the poverty impacts of biofuel projects, a combination of cross-sectional and longitudinal uh, data collection that is still underway. Is that right? Or Okay, so the project is still underway. So without further ado, may I invite Oliver Johnson, who's looking very, I don't know, Oliver Johnson, sorry. Oliver Johnson, I was looking at Matthew, uh, to come and share. <laughs> Okay. 
Thank you very much. Um, I started about a, well, maybe six months to a year ago chatting with a few colleagues um, and uh, old friends about uh, the idea of inclusive energy transitions. And um, so we started thinking about how we might explore this topic. And uh, so I'd like to present just a, a little bit of the sort of exploratory work that we have uh, done. I like to call it exploratory. It kind of means we don't know what we're doing, but uh, we'd, we'd like to get somewhere with it. And it's great having come to uh, SEI um, in late August that this is also a, a, an issue area where there seem to be a lot of other people who are interested in um, discussing it. And so this particular presentation is based uh, on collaborative work with uh, colleagues, uh, a colleague, Georgetta Vidikin at the German Development Institute, where I used to work, and Rob Byrne and Dave Ockwell at the University of Sussex, where I did my PhD. So it's not all my work, it's a kind of collaborative effort. Um, and I'll use the, uh, the case of solar PV in Kenya to kind of explore the, what do we mean by being inclusive? Because I think when, we, when, I, when I start, we started thinking about this issue, I think you have to start as well by looking at some of the, the, the kind of uh, the, the concept of inclusiveness. So how do we make energy transitions, which there has been a lot of work on uh, related to developing clean energy systems, how do we make them inclusive? So, on the one hand, we know that energy uh, transitions are very difficult. Uh, they face lots of uh, lock-in, vested interests. Um, you have to overcome certain power relations. You need lots of uh, development of new knowledge. And uh, the innovation, diffusion of clean technologies is, is essential to this process. But... For many countries, and I'm going to focus on developing countries, but I think we can extrapolate to, to others, and I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll manage to do that. Um, we have to think also about, well, what does this mean for the poor? What does this mean for the losers if we trans transition to, a, to a, a cleaner energy systems? You know, how can we make sure there's better energy access? How do we make energy affordable, accessible, uh, reliable? And then one of the key things that many countries are facing is, well, what does this mean for jobs? What does this mean for economic deployment, uh, economic uh, development? So this is the kind of uh, some of the issues that we have to consider when we are thinking of a transition. It's not just about the climate change aspect, but it's also about uh, wider development issues. So the question me and my colleagues wanted to pose, first of all, was, Although there's this rhetoric about being inclusive as though this will change the world, is it enough to be inclusive? So we started thinking about that idea um, based on um, colleagues uh, who are uh, at, at the University of Sussex who wrote a, an interesting blog article about inclusive innovation, uh, Adrian Smith and Adrian, Adrian Ely, and uh, think, using their, some of the ideas they had to develop this kind of small framework. So thinking about dimensions of inclusion... We can think about how are people included, who is chosen to be included, and, and why are people included. And so then we, the extent of inclusion can, can range from limited inclusion, so we include them just as potentially beneficiaries, just a few people, um, just including them um, to ensure the success of that specific project, from, to moderate and then more extensive inclusion, so including them as decision makers as well as beneficiaries, um, including them in building up capabilities, so beyond just that specific project. And what my feeling and our, my, uh, our feeling is that the form and depth, what I've called there, are all about participation, because when you typically ask people what they mean by inclusion, they say it's about participation, making sure people participate. Well, I argue that, we argue that uh, that's one part of the picture, but this third dimension, scope, is really important because you can include people just for um, the purpose of that particular project, but if you really want development, you have to build up long-term capabilities. And uh, so the research from, from innovation studies shows that we really need to move beyond a limited kind of inclusion 
that is just ensuring the su success of that specific project or intervention, but really a systemic, a systemic approach building long-term capabilities. And I want to show you through the cases of uh, PV in Kenya what, what we kind of mean by that. So Kenya has got a long uh, history with, with solar PV going back many, many years. But um, the donor community has had a big role in, in the development of that, that market. And IFC have been involved in a couple of projects um, to, to kind of uh, promote solar PV. The first, one of the main ones was the PVMTI, Photovoltaic Market Transformation Initiative. Started in 1998 supposedly it was ending around 2007, so a 10-year project, although it's had a little extension. And it was all about dispersing about $5 million in Kenya in loans to consumers and suppliers uh, of, of, of PV, uh, solar PV home systems. And the idea was that this would overcome a perceived uh, finance constraint in the market. The outcome, sadly, was that only financed 170 solar home systems. And this is $5 million going out. So the deals with the banks that they were, they were trying, to, trying to set up fell apart after very long negotiations and, and contentions over the kind of um, riskiness of, of uh, supporting certain banks. And things like training and quality assurance uh, was, were just ignored. So from the inclusiveness perspective that I've presented, although there was actually wide participation in this project and a lot of buy-in, the, the various actors were involved in the design and the implementation, the scope was very limited. So it just focused on finance. The IFC again, incidentally, tried, tried another tactic this, way, this time with uh, the Lighting Africa initiative um, and started in 2007 and really focused on building capabilities and supporting an enabling environment. They had awareness raising, market research, product testing, development of quality assurance methods, knowledge sharing, and the result has been a rapid expansion of the, of the, of the PV, particularly, well, it's the lighting market, so a slightly different se segment of, this, of the market, but there's been this rapid expansion of that market uh, in the past four years. And compared to PVMTI, this had a much broader scope. It was thinking much more systemically about the innovation system um, and knowledge, developing, building up knowledge, sharing knowledge, and uh, building these capabilities. So just to end on a couple of insights then, participation is an important way to ensure needs and desires of users are met and understood. So if we really want um, to to um, meet the needs of the poor and the marginalised, we need to uh, understand their needs and really understand uh, the context that we're dealing with here. But participation is not enough. Just because they participate, if the scope of the intervention is very limited, then um, you're really not going to necessarily get a, a complete transformation and really build up long-term capabilities that can help people uh, develop uh, more. Okay, thank you.